Okay, so hi everybody. In this video, I'm gonna take the concepts that we talked about on the previous video, which are mostly to do with the lens equations associated with basic ray optics, and ask you to consider some potential conceptual problems and also hopefully at the end do a calculation problem for you. So just to remind you, the basic lens equation is this. It relates where an object is positioned relative to a lens to where the image is created by that lens. And basically it's a reciprocal relationship, one over the focal length, which is a property of the lens, is one over the distance to the object plus one over distance to the image. So usually you rewrite this so that the image is over here by itself. Now, the other thing is the magnification, which is the ratio of the height of the object to the height of the, Im of the image, which is also just the ratio of the two distances. And what I want to talk through today is go through a few different questions that help, you know, turn these from just equations to things that actually express relationships between these parameters and give you some insight. One very basic question is where would you want to put an object relative to the lens in order to get the biggest magnification from it, assuming it's a lens like this one? So that is a fairly broad question, but you could imagine me asking a question of a similar form, which is, for example, I give you a lens with a focal length, here's the focal point, and I give you four positions along it. Here's A, here's B, here's C, here's D. They're all along the axis of the lens. So the questions that I could legitimately ask you are, which of these positions produces a real image? which positions produce a virtual image, and which positions produce the largest real image? These are all questions I think you could answer. And I'll pause a moment, and you can pause the video and think about how you would approach them. Now, one way to approach them is if I gave you actual distances for these four, you could calculate the distance to the image and the magnification for each of these data points. And just to say, you can rewrite the distance to the image in the following form. This is the reciprocal of the previous thing. It's just the distance to the object times the focal length over the difference. And then the magnification is just those ratios. So you could use these formulas to calculate it individually, but what I also want you to do is understand some trends here. So we can combine these two expressions and write down what the magnification is. So we take this expression for the location of the image, we take this expression for the magnification, which is just this over d naught, that cancels out the d naught and throws a minus sign, but we're not caring too much about that, and we get this expression. The magnification is just the ratio of the focal length to the difference between where the object is and the location of the focal length. Now if you look at this expression, hopefully you get a better sense of where you get big values of m, where the height of the image is much bigger than the height of the object. If you want that to be the case, you, want, you either want a really long focal length, but more practically, you want this difference in the denominator to be small. So you want the location of the object to be close to the focus. So going back to that problem we were talking about, use this to start to understand it. Now, one thing to notice is this now makes it very clear where things are going to be. If Remember, if we put to, if we put D naught outside of F, so like A and B, then the distance to the image is over here. It's a real image. So A and B, which have D naught greater than F, those work. Those give real images. 
By contrast, if I put d naught less than f, which means over here, then this becomes negative, and di is over here. These are virtual images. So c and d both produce virtual images. OK. If we want to know which produces the largest real image, we now need to consider a and b. Look at this expression again. The thing is, we need this thing to be small. This thing is big here because we're relatively far from the focus. It's small here, which is close to the focus. So B will produce a bigger magnification than A will. Similarly, C will produce a bigger magnification than D will. If you want magnification, you want your object near a focal point. That should hopefully make some amount of sense. OK, so that's one way to understand these things. Another conceptual question I would ask you to consider is, how does a magnifying glass work? We talked about this in the previous video. If you put an object inside the focal distance, you get a virtual image, and it's often larger than this, especially if you put it close enough. It's almost always larger. Because if you put d naught less than f, this thing is always less than this. Great. But wait, how does this actually work? Yes, it's created a virtual image. But the rays of light are diverging. They're not converging in any way. There's no way to produce a real image with this. So. Why can we use a magnifying glass like this to produce something that we can see as, a lar as an enlarged image? More generally, what is a virtual, how do we make a virtual image visible? Like, how do we actually see this? Well, the thing to understand about things like magnifying glasses is that they're not the only lens in the system. You don't just put a piece of CCD or your retina behind a magnifying glass. You put your eye behind a magnifying glass. And your eye has a lens in it. This lens can take diverging light and make it converge. So, but the thing to understand here is what's happened is that as far as the eye is concerned, these light rays going into the eye appear to have be coming from this larger image. So once they've gone through this thing, this image, this real object is no longer the relevant thing. It's this image that you have to consider. Now, for how the lens focuses the light somewhere on the retina. And this is often how things work. You, we can use another lens to turn a virtual image into a real image on our. And this often happens implicitly because our eyes have such a lens. And in fact, you might think, well, wait, this isn't a case that might be di make the image smaller. Yep. But the total magnification depends on how much the first lens magnified it, then how much our lens in our eye reduced it. And the balance between those determines how big it appears. And this is the basic principle that crops into a lot of optical instruments. For example, microscopes. Microscopes have one lens that's fairly close to the cell or thing that you're particularly interested in, which produces a image that is magnified to some extent. But then you have an eyepiece in front of it, another lens, which takes that object and could magnify it a second time. And now, again, in this case, we have diverging light rays in this particular case because this object is inside the focal length for the eyepiece. But then your own eye can bring them closer. If you want to 
face your eye with a piece of CCD or some other electronics, you would need another optical element to actually get the image. So this is just giving you a sense that these images are useful because they allow you to chain optical elements together. So that's another concept that's worth understanding. The another question I want you to think about though is the other end of that. Clearly you could produce fairly high magnifications by putting your object close to the focal point, but there's lots of times you can't do that. For example, I work in astronomy. I'm looking at things very far away. I cannot create an optical system that puts the focal point near the sun. That doesn't work very well. How do you make a decent image of things that are far away? Can you think of a way to do that? Well, the way you do it is you again use multiple optical elements to do that. This is the basic principle behind telescopes. For example, what you can do, and it's more clearly shown in this bottom figure, if you have something that is very far away, the light is only weakly non-parallel, you can use a normal converging lens to produce a small image of it. It's a small image, but the advantage is it's right next to you. You then can use a second lens in the eyepiece, which can either be converging or diverging, which then magnifies that image so that you can see it with your eye or whatever other optical elements are around. So again, a pair of lenses is, what is often what you need to get practicality out. What you're basically doing is using one of these to produce an image where the other one can do its work. And this is why, you know, most optical systems have a tube with two lenses between them. And this involves a whole bunch more fun math, which we're not going to get into too much uh, here. It just simply because it's optical. Okay. So those are just understanding what lenses can do and mirrors can do a similar thing and they're just harder to draw and gives you a sense of why multiple lenses and mirrors can be helpful. The final conceptual thing I would want you to understand is a little more abstract in this sense, but it's equally important for thinking about these things. This is back to the original picture we had. We have a lens here that we're using in front of a CCD detector to image two light sources. A red light source up here, which is being focused onto this point of the detector. A blue light source here, which is being focused onto this part of the detector. This is if we have this full lens. What if I only had half the lens? What if I literally cut this lens in half and got rid of the bottom half and replaced it with like a piece of black paper, something that blocks light? What would happen in that case? What would the detector see? Would it only be able to see the red source? Would it only be able to see the blue source? Or would you have an image of both sources? And ask you to think about that for a second before going on. It's very logical to think you can only see one of these or the other because it's like, well, the paper would hide one of these objects. And you might logically think the lower one will disappear. The key thing to understand, though, is light from throughout the region of the lens is being focused here. This entire surface of the lens is being struck from light from both sources. So if we get rid of half the lens, we get rid of basically half that light for both sources. So from the red source, we still have light going more or less through the center. We still have light going through the top part and being focused down here. In the bottom, 
we still have this light going more or less straight through, it might be a little blocked, but we also have light going up here and being bent. So we actually get both images. We don't get as much light, so they're not as efficient at doing it. But there's no requirement that you have a full disk to produce an image. You can do this with a hole drilled out of the center of the lens. In fact, often in telescopes and microscopes, you'll do that. Like mirrors often have pieces cut out of them. They're not, they do interrupt some of the light, but as long as enough light is being focused appropriately, that won't destroy your ability to make an image. And this is a relatively remarkable thing, but it is an important thing to understand. You don't need to have a complete lens to get an image. You just need enough of it. Okay, so those are all the kind of concept problems I'd like you to think about. I'm also gonna try here just to do a calculation problem in the vein of uh, other calculation problems we've done before. Uh, I'll do this one on a PowerPoint slide just because to smooth transitions. And it doesn't require too much in the way of drawing, I hope. Okay, so what we're gonna do is consider one of these problems that is from the same sort of thing as your text, as your other expert TA problems. Suppose a 200 millimeter focal length telephoto lens is being used to photograph mountains 7.5 kilometers away. We've got a couple of questions here. What is the image distance in meters for this lens? And then what is the image height in centimeters of a 1,050 meter high cliff on one of the mountains? So these are examples of the kind of problems you'll also have on your assignments. And so we can start to think about those. Let's start with the first one. So first of all, what is the image distance? Well, what do we want? We want the image distance. That's di. That's the thing we're looking for. OK, what do we know? Well, we know the focal length. So we know f is 200 millimeters. And since this is a case where units get important, I'm going to write this in meters. 200 millimeters is 0 0.2 meters, because there's a thousand millimeters in a meter. Okay, and then what else do we know? Well, we know how far away the mountains are. That's d naught, which is 7.5 kilometers or 7,500 meters. Okay, so what, what equation relates what we have to what we want? Well, that is, again, the, equa the uh, lens equation, which is 1 over di equals 1 over f minus 1 over d naught. Now, you could use the other form of this, but I'm using this one for a very specific reason. And we'll see about it in a second. First of all, do we have, but before we get there, let's ask, do we have everything we need? Well, we're looking for di, we're given f, we're given d naught. We're done. Now, you can actually figure out more or less the answer to this without doing any math. You just have to think about what these things are. But I'm going to write it out just to give a sense. So 1 over di is 1 over 0 0.2 meters minus 1 over 7,500 meters. 
this thing is, so this is a number. One over 0.2 is about five. So that's about five, great. Five over meters. What's this? Is that a big number or a small number? Hopefully, you can recognize it is a small number. If you put this in your calculator, it is 5 per meter minus 0 0.00013 per meter. That's a really small number compared to this. It might matter in certain cases, but not for the thing we're ultimately interested in calculating. This thing is such a small factor, it is practically zero. So this is approximately, and to a pretty decent approximation, one over 0 0.2 meters. So 1 over di is 0.2 meters. Is, so the image is created very close to the focal point. Now, that's an approximation. You might say, oh, I don't like that. I, I want to know the exact number. OK, that's fair. it is going to be about 0 0.20008. It's, it's a very, it is really close to this. So this is a decent approximation. And this is nice thing about distant things. They all focus to roughly the same location. Okay. So yes, it's not exactly that, but that's a good approximation, especially for the next part. What is the image height in centimeters of a 10, 50 meter high cliff on one of these mountains? Well, what we're looking for now is H of I, right? That's image height. What do we know? Well, we know all this stuff, but what we also know we're given now is the height of the object and that is one zero five zero meters. Now, what relates what we know to what we don't know? Well, this is the expression for magnification. Magnification is the height of the image over the height of the object. Well, okay, so the height of the image. So does this work? Almost. We want the height of the image. We know the height of the object. We just need magnification. Do we know the magnification? Well, we do, in fact, because the other expression for the magnification is that it's minus, and the minus sign is kind of irrelevant here because we're not asked if the image is inverted or not, is also the distance to the image divided by the distance the object. These are both the magnification. Now we know hi, we know h naught, we know d naught, that's here, and we know di, it's here. So this expression, we have everything we need. We can just rewrite that out, multiply it through by h naught, and we get hi is minus each not di over d naught. And we've got the numbers for all of that. Now, we we're actually asked what the image height is, which is technically the absolute value of this. So I put little absolute value signs. That basically makes this a plus. But if you like, I'll just put 
absolute value signs around everything. And then uh, fix that. So what is this? Which is just to say, once you've done the absolute value sign, it's just this. So now we just stick in our numbers. And we basically get 10, 50 meters, so units. DI is 0 0.5. Point two meters divided by d naught, which is seventy five hundred meters. Notice meters cancels meters, so we just have units of meters, which makes sense. And now we can stick those numbers in a calculator and see what the value is. And it is. 050 times 0.2 divided by 7,500 is, that works out to be 0 0.028 meters, but we were asked to give it in centimeters, so we have to multiply this by one to convert units. So we know there's 100 centimeters per one meter. Those two, th this is ratio is one. We can always multiply everything by one. Cancel out that, and we get, just have to multiply this by 100 to get centimeters, and it's 2.8 centimeters. It's a pretty reasonable size when you think about it. It's not ridiculously big, it's about an inch. So this telephoto lens gives you an image, that image of that cliff that you could imagine capturing on a CCD or maybe with a little more help, that sort of thing. So this is just an example of how to use these equations. You have a couple of problems like this on your assignment, and most of it will involve getting these sorts of expressions and being able to use them in this sort of way. Anyway, thank you all for your attention, and see you next time.